Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Jeff Colson with Junior Hockey Live, and it is Wednesday night. We're waiting a little for uh, Bloomer to get in. Bloomer is caught in traffic, and uh, nothing really much I can do about that except for say hurry, and we'll get there. We're going to have some fun tonight. Hopefully, this will be educational too, but in a different way. Uh, we're going to we're gonna play trivia, and uh, we're going to play trivia with Mike. I'm going to ask Mike questions. Mike can answer them. You can help Mike answer the questions, so you'll get a chance to uh, come on uh, right away. Jump on. Tell us where you're watching from. Tell us who you are. Uh, if you're involved in hockey, let us know. Uh, if you get players involved, let us know. We'd love to know a little bit about you. Uh, as usual, we did something last week, and it was severely, severely successful, I guess you'd say. Highly successful. And that's we uh, we said anybody that subscribes to our YouTube Junior Hockey Advisor YouTube page, we will give you the copy, our webinar, seminar, uh, online class, online course, uh, all about the Junior Hockey Advisor. We covered this last week, or we covered this uh, Monday night, I'm sorry, and it was highly successful. We had lots of comments, lots of conversation, great questions, and I think we covered – a lot of information. So if you'd like a copy of that, all you have to do is uh, like and subscribe to our Junior Hockey Advisor YouTube page. And when you do that, just send me a DM off of the Facebook page, the Facebook discussion page, and I'll gladly get you a discount code for zero, 100% cost covered. Uh, we've had these uh, online and we've been selling them for years. Now, you know, I don't solicit much on the dis discussion page. So uh, it's usually you're coming through our web page or you hear about it through uh, one of our other sources. So if you want that, grab it. it it'll help us out a lot. We uh, we picked up, I think, 50 subscribers over the last 24 hours uh, since the uh, broadcast. And that's awesome for us because, uh, you know, it's, you know, Facebook, we sneeze and we get 50 new people. YouTube, uh, we uh, that's a slow growing audience for, for us. And I'm not really sure why. And hey, if you're good at YouTube and you want to, you know, find a way to grow our audience and help us grow our audience, give me a DM. I'd be glad to talk to you because, uh, like I said, we uh, on one side of the coin, we we we've grown this uh, by thousands over the last two years, and we keep, we're uh, we're still struggling to get to that 1,000 mark. I think we're in the low 700s now. But uh, thanks to you, I know we'll get there and uh, appreciate it. So uh, while we're waiting for Mike, let's check in with a couple people, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And uh, I want to say hi from just outside St. Louis. My son is in his last year of juniors in the NA3HL. Well, congratulations on getting him through there. Uh, this is a great time for hockey for him because it's like being a senior in high school. Uh, they Hockey players usually take pride on being in their last year on their team and, and helping out. So good for him. I hope he's having a great time. And uh, I hope there's some good things in hockey and in school coming up for him in the future here. Uh, we've also got uh, Troy coming on saying, and joining from Connecticut, son is a 16 in the 3HL. Uh, so it's a 3HL night. Uh, good to see that. And uh, we've got uh, Frank on. Frank says, grandson, 18-year-old, uh, Notre Dame Hounds in the SJHL in Saskatchewan. So uh, if you want square tires on cold winter days, that's where you go. Leave your car outside overnight, and you get up, and you, you're actually – Got a big flat spot on the back the bottom of your tire. I was up scouting uh, in Saskatchewan one time. Actually, no, and that's a trivia question coming up tonight. I was not in Saskatchewan, uh, and that is part of the, the uh, trivia question. So I'll leave it at that uh, for a little bit later on. Come on, tell us who we are. Uh, join us. If you got questions, uh, you know, we'll, we'll still do questions and answer for you and would love to uh, try to help you out. So I'm Jeff Colson. I am a hockey guy. I do this because I'm a hockey guy. We, uh, I've been doing this for over 30 something years. I, I currently work as a player development director for a team in the North American hockey league. Uh, but I've been a, a junior owner for numerous junior teams at many different levels. I've been a general manager. I've been a head coach uh, and I've been a parent and that's important too. And uh, along with all that, a fan of the game, especially the junior level, I love the junior level, love to talk about it, love a junior in college. I like the transition periods between the two. Um, so anything we can do to help you with your process, answering questions, that's why we're here. 
We're also here because we want to make sure that you get some, uh, I'm slightly biased because I work for a junior program, but I try to come across as objective and unbiased to your situation. I'm not attached to you and I'm not attached to anything you're doing in hockey. So I can objectively give you an answer that, to steer you. Now, if you're a superstar looking to play in the North American Hockey League, I might angle it a little bit different in that situation. Uh, I'm kidding, but my, my point is uh, this is not set up for me to gain off of you. It's for you to gain off of myself and anybody else that's on the show with us. So take advantage of it. You know, have some fun. Uh, I sure as have fun. Uh, it's a, It's been a great week. This is a tight week for a lot of uh, of hockey right now because what happens with a lot of teams right now is – they start dropping uh, players in different ways. And when I say drop, it's not really the right phraseology. Uh, if teams are making a run, they're looking to bolster for that run. In other words, a junior team that's in first to fourth place, and they really think they got a shot to win their division or, or win whatever league they're in their championship, they may be looking for that last piece or last uh, piece or two for the puzzle. Not every team will trade at the deadline. Uh, but like in the North American Hockey League, I think our deadline's coming up in about a week. So, uh, you know, there's a good chance that some teams will move players back and forth this week. But, you know, one of the great things about the sport, and, uh, you know, most coaches have, uh, they have a heart, I, I should say. Um, I know in the North American Hockey League, what you'll see a lot of times during this type of year, and this is several different leagues doing the same thing. Uh, I'm only checking to see, uh, if Mike's here yet, I know he's going to be popping on in a second. He's just texting me. Um, so one of, the, one of the things they'll do is, if let's say you're a last place team in the North American Hockey League and you don't have a chance to make the playoffs. What a lot of teams will do is they'll look at their players that are last year players and see if they can move them, uh, logically move them to a team that could use them for the run. Uh, it's a good move. I can tell you it happened with my son. My son was on a last place team. Uh, an interesting team because it was a last place team, first year coach, but the most commitments in the whole division, most division one commitments in the whole division, um, which is a really bizarre anomaly. You normally don't see that. Okay. But what happened was when it came to playoff time, they started moving the, 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 the senior players, last year players and moving them up and out to other teams. So uh, that's how my team ended up on uh, the, the uh, Shreveport Mudbugs. Uh, and had a phenomenal run, and they run the, they won the Robertson Cup. Uh, went from last place team to first place team, and was a, a, a key component to, to making the run. Uh, that's the beauty of this type of this time of year. So, part of you, part of players are anxious, but there's a lot of good hockey players out there that are that are that are looking to move at this time of year because they're hoping their coach can do something to help them and get them on a team. Not every player gets that opportunity. Not every player is is going to fall into the, the first place team that wins the championship. But uh, boy, oh boy, there are some players that will get a, get a shot here. Uh, fresh fresh uh, lease on life, and uh, and hopefully they have a great time with that. So uh, while we're waiting for uh, Mike to jump on here, uh, let's see who else we've got. We've got Linden, Michigan. If you don't know where that is, that's uh, just south of Flint, uh, a little bit southwest or south. Uh, just don't get all the way to Flint if you're coming up from the Detroit area. Uh, says Sun is a QB on the a decent tier two team, which is enjoying, which is ending soon. He wants to play juniors a, a, to prep for college. Uh, what's our next step? We'll catch you. We'll catch up with you on that one a little bit later uh, in the in the broadcast. I'll come back to that one. And if I don't put a comment on there, to remind me to. Brandon from Amherst on there. Good to see some Western New York. I'm assuming you mean. Amherst, Western New York, or is that Amherst in a different state? Let us know, Brandon. I, I'd be interested in knowing uh, where you're at. Uh, which one do you recommend? Uh, which one do you recommend the NAL or the BCHL? We'll cover that a little bit. But I also have tons of video that talk about the differences in the league. Um, you know, if you, you know, put it, put it this way, you're in a pretty good spot if your choices are uh, choosing between those two leagues. Oh, you're not you're not in a bad spot at all. If your two choices are if you're going to play in the uh, NAL or play in the BCHL. Uh, I'm not saying you can make a, a bad decision, but I can tell you this, uh, most likely either decision is going to work out just fine for you. So uh, thoughts on the NCDC uh, expansion on the West? 
I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll jump into this one because we're still waiting for Mike to come on so we can start our night O trivia, and it's going to be a blast. We're going to have some fun. Uh, I, I'd really like to see you guys participate. I'll ask a question to Mike, and I'll give you guys time to, uh, to actually jump in when the questions start rolling. We've got them all up and loaded so you can see them. And, uh, but let's jump on this question first. Um, and even though Mike's here, I'm going to, I'm going to put Mike on and he can listen to the question too. And, uh, Bloomer, how you doing? We're already rolling. We've already covered everything. We already had, we already had the whole trivia night and, uh, just wrapping up and saying good night. So, uh, got anything to say? Um, good night. Uh, just started. Just started. We're uh, I'm tap dancing. Actually, put on the the steel cloppers and uh, was doing the cane and the whole thing, you know. So I anyway, we to be spinning plates and doing a bunch of stuff, just kind of killing time until the uh, star got here, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. We we do have one question I want to jump into. Uh, we've covered this co- topic before before we get to trivia, but uh, the the question came up just a second ago. Uh, thoughts on the NCDC? And uh, let's see if that'll pop up. There you go. Right across Mike's face. Uh, thoughts on the NCDC expansion in the West. And uh, covered it before. Uh, we'll, we'll easily cover it again. Your thoughts on this, Mike? I mean, I think that uh, there's not going to be a NCDC West when it comes to, like, the complete talent of the current NCDC. It'll just be a grouping of teams that used to be the Western States League that now – is a part of the NCDC, but there's no way they're going to be able to all of a sudden increase the talent of what was already out there. There's just not enough players available. And those programs are still for the most part going to be ran by the same organizations they were before. So I think, you know, maybe over a long period of time, they can help increase that, that level a little bit more, but it's going to be more in line with the USPHL premier. It's just going to be out West. Uh, spot on, spot on. Uh, I gave the story the last time we talked about this. Uh, I used to be an owner in the USPHL before the NCDC. The premier was the highest level. All the teams that are in the NCDC were premier and it went premier and then elite below that. And I think we had empire. So we had three levels. They just changed the name to NCDC to distinguish it a little bit from the USPHL. However, all the same players. You look at that list of NCDC teams, except for a couple of expansion ones, was the USPHL Premier. The US Premier, USPHL used to be – what league, Mike? you know where I'm going with this? Say that again. What league was the USPHL before it was the uh, USPHL? The E – The EHL. EJHL. Yeah, it's the EJHL. So, you know, we all – we all owners of that league uh, – the, were members with a few of the teams in the EHL, and the EHL uh, was formed with the split between those two. So all the teams that you see in the NCDC that are non-expansion teams, the, the, the core teams, were all EGHL teams. They split over here in the EHL core uh, that, that started the EHL, went over here and they picked up some other teams for, from some other areas, the Atlantic Juniors, uh, Empire League, some other teams like that. So EHL was formed, USPHL was formed. So, but I want to move back the the year or two or three before that. So same players, NCDC players across the board, same exact leadership you have now, same ownerships were making the decisions. And uh, no, this is not a knock on it. It's just the reality of it is um, the South was really pressuring to try to get into the EJHL because it was the best league at the time on the East Coast. Uh, all of your Division One commits, even even NHL commits or NHL uh, draft picks, were coming out of the EJ. It was a phenomenal league, uh, well sized, well placed as far as travel. Uh, there's not much you could say that was wrong with the league at the time, and it was a much you know, as far as the output. The output is nothing like what the NCDC does now. It was much more in line with something between the NAL and the USHL, somewhere in there. Uh, great brand of hockey. So when the South started pressuring with their teams, the, uh, the EJ said, okay, we'll form a South division. And they gave them a number of what their tuition was going to be every year or their, their league fee was going to be every year. They accepted it. 
And we as owners had a nice check at the end of the year from the fees that came in from those teams that was divvied up among all the ownership. So it wasn't a bad thing for ownership. We actually enjoyed having the South. Was there any crossover play? No. No teams in the EJ ever played EJ South teams. Was it on the same level? No. You look at the rankings and, you know, it was pretty clear to see that, you know, EJ still was the EJ and as far as output, college players, you know, the, the South would put some players into uh, Division Three, and if you were playing Division One, you were coming out of the EJ. So since it's all the same players and it's the same script, except instead of going South, it's going West, my assumption is you're going to see the same thing. You're going to have – uh, the NCDC free brand of hockey out west, um, and at first they might be able to you know pull a couple players in because you know they get uh, the allure of playing in the NCDC. Um, but if I had a choice between playing in the NCDC for a, a brand that's already been established or a new brand, unless I'm out there sightseeing and want to see mountains, you know I'm probably going to go to the brand that's already been there. That's that's my opinion as a person that like yourself, that works in the industry, I, I, I find it hard that a really good player headed to the NCDC is going to make that jump. Now, will it be NCDC? Sure. Yeah, you call, call it whatever you want. You could call it Bozo the Clown League. I don't care. But you're going to get the same product that was there before. You're not going to get NCDC product. I absolutely highly doubt that the NCDC, those teams are going to travel. Part of the reason why they got rid of the peripheral programs in the NCDC, your Rochester's and your Syracuse, is because they wanted to push the NCDC to the East Coast more and get rid of those six-hour bus trips. So all those teams want to stay close to home. They want to play close to home. It's good for their budget. It's good for their 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 uh, team. Uh, it's it's any team that doesn't have to travel a lot. It's a good situation. So I hope that helps a little bit with the answer. Uh, it's not that I think it's going to be a bad situation. It's going to be opportunity, but it's not going to change anything in my opinion. My opinion is yeah. your NCDC is going to be the strongest part of it, that whole USPHL pyramid, and the, uh, the the new West division will fall in line somewhere, just like you said, maybe a hair above the uh, premier. But, uh, you know. Yeah. I think the best way to, to kind of make it so it, it's a clearer picture of, like, how the two would be different is – we said it before when we've highlighted the NCDC on, on why that league is good. And some of the best players that play in the NCDC are kids that were committed when they were 15, 16 years old already. They're from out East, whether it's mass or New York or New Jersey or somewhere in that area, Philadelphia. And instead of them, if they can't play in the USHL, instead of them going somewhere in the North American league and playing, you know, in Texas or New Mexico or, you know, name the place, they can stay home, stay local, and play in the NCDC. Well, none of that applies to any of the teams that'll be out West because where those locations are, you're not going to have that hockey factory like you do out East that can keep the talent there. So are you going to get kids from that New York, New England area to go all the way out West to play in the NCDC, or are they going to choose to play now in the North American League? You know, if their options yeah. are outside of the NCDC East, yeah. you're still, like you said, the, the caliber of player that's going to be out West playing in those leagues, even though it's branded as NCDC, you're going to be competing with the USPHL premier and the NA3 for that type of like top player from those leagues yeah. to play there instead of the Western States League, which would probably be maybe a little touch behind maybe the NA3 or the USPHL right. premier. You're, you're not going to pull one kid – in my opinion, again, this is just one one, you know, clown that's got a uh, a blog and a a stream going. Uh, you're not going to pull anybody out of the, the NAHL. You're not going to pull anybody out of the BCHL um, unless it's purely economics. You won't pull anybody out of the AJ either, um, just because those are high caliber leagues. So meaning meaning economics, if if a kid's got to play, you know, pay any type of money in the BCHL, which I just had somebody on Monday night saying that their their fee is seven thousand dollars Canadian now. Um, anybody else has got information on that? I'd love to hear more information. I didn't get a chance to call up and talk to any coaches or GMs this week that I know we've been kind of busy, uh, but um, that'd be interesting to know if they are charging every team across the board's charging now, uh, because that means that there's you know 
virtually just a couple choices for free hockey now when it comes to uh, ju- juniors in the North American area. So anyway, uh, you know, were we killing time with that answer? Yeah, but that's an important question. It's a great question. And the rest of the questions we'll take uh, after after trivia tonight. So here's the rules. Once again, I'm Jeff. That's Bloomer. That's Mike Bloom. And uh, this is the Junior Hockey Live. We do this every Wednesday that we can. Uh, as long as uh, we are breathing, we try to get out and do this. Uh, we talk juniors. We talk about the leagues, the players, the coaches, uh, and the teams. Uh, our other information on other uh, nights that we do live streams has much more to do with uh, the development path and how to get from point A to point B in your hockey uh, path. So tonight, instead of just talking about teams, what we thought we'd do is ask some trivia questions. It would love you to participate. So I'm going to ask questions of Mike. Uh, when Mike can't answer them, uh, even if he can answer them, let's uh, jump on and give him a hand if you can. Uh, we've got a nice little audience built up already. And uh, you don't have to, but we'd love to see you participate. And you know what? If you give a wrong answer, don't worry about it. Nobody's judging. There is, there is a judgment-free zone. This is the – what's that What's that gym that uh, uses that judgment-free zone, the purple <laughs> equipment? What's uh, uh, that Planet Hollywood or uh, Planet Fitness? Planet Fitness. We're the Planet Fitness of hockey advice online. No and judgment. I'll probably give more wrong answers than right answers. So whoever's chatting in at home uh, – I can't see any of your answers, but uh, I'll probably give more wrong ones than, than you would. I'll put any answers up on the screen so you can see them, okay? So <laughs> how does that sound? And, uh, hey, hey, Phil, I see your comment coming in. I'll see if I can jump on that after we get trivia done. We'll we'll stick around a little bit and talk about it. So um, let's jump on board with the trivia and get rolling. Uh, look at that. We've got ourselves a nice – trivia screen and we're going to go to slides only and make that sucker a little bit bigger look at that how's that that like almost it. is that almost like eighth grade professional yes got I'm you sure and i on the bottom the there grader, the eighth graders now are so equipped with technology that this is probably like kindergarten stuff <laughs> yeah, they're, they're looking at going what are these clowns doing exactly. okay it's our our junior hockey live presents the first annual north american trivia quiz competition uh, I was going to put Stump Bloomer on there, but I figured, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep it a little bit more like the Emmys, you know. So nice, nice and first annual is kind of a nice touch. Yes. Okay, here we go. First question. First question. Let me get over here. First question. It should be popping up here. You probably have to go in presentation mode. There you go. There we go. Currently, the Johnstown Tomahawks play in the Cambria Cambria War Memorial, where the film Slap Shot was filmed. The film was filmed. What was the name of the team in the movie? The so Chiefs. The Chiefs. Okay, that's a little bit. That's half the answer. What? Yeah. Was the, the Charlestown Chiefs? Charlestown Chiefs. There we go. Good answer. You're one for one. That's not bad, man. That's not bad. That's a good one. I could uh, I could handle that for the first one. Uh, you, you know these guys, right? I'll throw this in there. Let's get some speed out. Here, all right? Keep your eyes open. Better passing. Better passing. We got a big trade coming up out there. Better come back with the wingers, maybe. Uh, tonight, tonight. Who wants uh, ice packs here? Uh, Why are they over here? Over here? This is my favorite part. That is great. I'm coming. I'm coming. All right. All right. A little, little PT. This is the best part. We're losing. <laughs> They're burying us alive. Eddie Shore. Oh, piss on Eddie Shore. Old time hockey. Piss on old time hockey. You're okay, ruined. we could go on forever, and yeah, it's a long clip, but. I thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> We're losing. <laughs> I just love the goalie coming in, still blocking shots because he's got the PTSD from the last period. So, you know, one of my kids had a chance to play down in Johnstown for the Tomahawks. Incredible experience. 
If you're a hockey fan, put it on your bucket list to go down and watch a game there. Uh, it is one of the best experiences as a fan. Uh, not a, you know, when I was scouting in there, I had a great time. When I was there as a dad, I had a great time. Uh, every time I walk in the building, I, I just thoroughly enjoy it. And there's a few reasons why. First of all, there are workers and fans that are still there from the 70s. So they, they, they literally are the same people that were there in the 70s. So they got that rock 'em, sock 'em, let's have fun, uh, rowdy crowd. Uh, and that's mixed in with the you know newer blood in the area. It's not, it's not a big moneyed town. It's a blue collar town across the board. And just like the Chiefs, they come across a very blue collar uh, program and the rink is uh, the same way. Uh, good concession stands. You walk down on the corner of the rink by where the locker room's at. They have a slap shot museum where you can go in and see all kinds of trivia from slap shot. The organ area is still up there. The, uh, you, you look around at the press box and things. It's all in place. It's a lot of fun to go there. Um, and if you're being a veteran, you know, a Marine Corps veteran myself, uh, the war memorial is built in and integrated around the mezzanine level. So as you walk around between periods and before or after the game, you can see all kinds of great stuff. Uh, highly recommended. If it's not on your bucket list, go. Uh, right next to it, there's a nice little restaurant right out in front across the street. It's only got like three tables in it, but it's got unbelievable food for only having three or four tables. Uh, great uh, drinks that are there. Uh, great drink prices, I should say. Uh, and you're not going to, you, you can't go wrong. So if you, you go down there, have a blast and it's a bucket list thing. You ready for the next one? No That's comment good. on that. I haven't been there. So it's definitely on the list of things to do. Okay, Michael. So Michael, what two American teams could possibly travel South to play a league game against a Canadian opponent? What two American teams could possibly travel south to play a league game against a Canadian opponent? Is that in the North American League or what? Uh, this what, is open what to any junior hockey in North America. Well, I'm sure if you're in Buffalo, there's places that you could go south to play. If you're in Detroit, Windsor is technically south of, of uh, Detroit. So... Um, Let's see. If you're the Buffalo Junior Sabers in the uh, OHL, oh, let's go. Let's go to the help. Let's see what the crowd is saying for you. And I'm afraid the crowd's not giving you much good advice here. We've got <laughs> Calgary and Edmonton, which are Canadian. A Canadian. Remember, the question says, "What two American teams could possibly travel south to play a league a league game?" against the Canadian opponent. So, you know, your friends are coming in here with Alaska. Oh, yeah, Fairbanks. Alaska. Uh, yeah, Wolverines. Kenai, Anchorage. And Anchorage. Ooh, they're really coming from everywhere on this. So if I travel south from Seattle and south from Minnesota, that's a long way to get to a Canadian opponent if I'm traveling south. Now, Mike, you're almost there. You were almost there. Are you ready for the answer, or do you, you want a, a, a little bit more time? I think I'm ready. I don't know. I'm out of guesses. Uh, and I'm very upset that we didn't get more, uh, <laughs> more help, help there from the, from from the, the peanut, peanut gallery. gallery. <laughs> so it's Saginaw and Flint of the OHL. And if you look on the map there in the thumb of yep. Michigan uh, to get down to Windsor, yeah, yeah, it's it's south with a little bit of east in it, but it's it's about as direct south as you can get for Flint and Saginaw to get down and play. You got to jump on seventy five. I don't know if they do that. They might go across in Sarnia and drive south, but I think they probably just head right down and you know take. Oh, by the way, so there's the map of the OHL. You can see there's uh, two teams in Michigan there, and there's also one in Erie, Pennsylvania. Three American teams there. Um, I got a chance to see the new Gordy Howe Bridge uh, two weekends ago going to and for, to and from uh, through Canada, uh, went across the, the old ambas ambassador bridge. And if you're driving from Canada to Detroit, it's on your left-hand side, and it's probably a mile or two down. But you can see all the big stanchions coming out of the water now, and uh, it's going to be pretty cool. If you don't know about it, Detroit and Windsor are putting a new bridge in called the Gordie Howe, and uh, it's a brand-new bridge that will connect uh, 
Windsor and Detroit, and it'll just be a, uh, you know, instead of driving on a bridge that's 100 years old, you know, you'll have at least a modern bridge to cross now. So it was really cool, uh, really, really interesting to see that. So, well, hey, uh, group out there, we got to do a little bit better job for, for Mike here. That was uh, – that was hey, not least, that was not a, the best effort. At least I called out the area in which you were talking about. It just wasn't specific teams. You did. You were close. You were real close. Okay, let's go on another number three. Question number three is Michael, what USPHL premier uh, team has the most junior or <laughs> the USPHL premier has the most junior teams in one league in North America? How many teams does that consist of? Wow. We just I, talked about this. I know. I want to say 92, but I actually think it's 71. The answer is 71. Let's see if anybody's going to help you and jump on and give you an answer. I know there's a few out there that are probably uh, just jumping on to elite prospects right now and trying to count them <laughs> out. real. So we got one that says answer number C coming in for you, Mike. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'll, I'll give you one hint. It's not C. So we've got another one coming in saying 71. We've got another one saying 71. And I think, I think you 71. I think you guys have got it. I think the answer, getting back over here and moving on, is 71 teams. So nice. and we and they're still scrolling and they're coming in like crazy now. We got 71 here and 71 there. Here is 71. Good job, group. As an overall group, you guys did very good. It feels like 92, but it's only it 71. <laughs> I, I was looking at the list of names on there today. I'm like, uh, I, don't even, I don't even know where this team plays out of, you know. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's because it's, it used to be the old Minnesota League. It used to be the Western States. It used to be um, geez, the Empire League. There's probably five or six good leagues that that's, uh, that consists of. So let's get on to the next question. Let's see if Mike can pull this out and get a good score. Michael, which North American league has the most players with the last name Smith? Which league in all of North American junior hockey has the most players with the last name Smith? Well, since the USPHL premier has the most teams, I'm just going to choose them. So you're going to go with the easy answer. Anybody going to help him out here? Anybody going to throw on? Any type of help for this. <laughs> like there's some expert out there that has this in their back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm the only idiot that looks up these kind of things. <laughs> so, Michael, you got it right. Well done. Well done. The one league is the USPHL Premier, and they have 12 players with the last name Smith. It sounds like a lot. It's almost a full team or you know a full couple lines. But uh, the USPHL premier, but when you've got, what, 71 teams, I guess it uh, that's not even one Smith per team, man. That's that's not even uh, one Smith per division. <laughs> right. Okay, let's go. Very good. I know you had a couple of answers coming. They came in late. Uh, Frank came in with the uh, North American Hockey League. Uh, <laughs> probably Thanks, good Frank. that you were a little late on that one, Frank. Uh, it wouldn't have helped him. All right, let's jump on and see Michael. Name four of the seven U.S.-based teams that play in Canadian Junior Leagues. Name four of the seven U.S.-based teams that play in Canadian Junior Leagues. Well, now, this one will be fun to see what answers come in. Uh, Seattle because... Thunderbirds in the WHL. You have the – Oh, uh, you know what? You know what? Flint, Already a mistake. Flint. Already a mistake. Because you're right on Seattle, but Seattle wasn't there. Michael, name four of the eight U.S.-based teams. Because <laughs> we, I didn't look at the uh, WHL. Ah, uh, well, you got Seattle from the WHL. Yeah, you got. We already talked about Saginaw and Flint. Okay, so your help coming in right now is saying Saginaw. Okay, that helps. Flint, that yep. helps. Got those. And ooh, and here's a good one. Sioux Eagles. Yeah, you and got the Flint. You got. You also have the. Uh, um, well, Buffalo Junior Sabers are not currently in the OJ. They but, are currently uh, on. They're just. They're just uh, not playing right now. But they yeah, are. They're dormant right now. Oh look, Tony's coming in strong for you here, Tony. Oh, Wenatchee in the BC League. Yeah. That's a good one too. And so, and then he's coming in again with a little bit of Saginaw action. 
Yep. KS is coming in with the Junior Sabres. Um, Seattle's coming in here again with uh, Se- uh, Saginaw Flint, yeah, Spokane. Spokane. Yep. yep. So you you got it. You uh, no need to kill this one. But since I I stayed out of that uh, the Western League, uh, your your answer might not be completely uh, proper. But oh, Phil comes in late. Phil comes in late, but comes in strong. Throws another oh, name oh. on there for you. Wow, good job, folks. You know, Home I think of, uh, McDavid and uh, DeBrinkett and Strom and geez, how many others? A lot. Okay, so very good job. Here's some of the names I know I I, I already named it, but probably the name that nobody got was wow, the Wisconsin the Lumberjacks. Lumberjacks. What wow. league, Mike? Uh, they are in the what is it the SIJHL? Very good, the Superior International Junior Hockey League. And if that's the first time you've heard of the Wisconsin Lumberjacks, folks, <laughs> it might be the last time you hear about them because it's a league that doesn't. Well, there's only six, seven teams. They don't get talked about a lot. And uh, even though they're a CJHL league, uh, they're designed at a little bit lower level than than most of the leagues. So, but yeah, good for them. Good for the Wisconsin Lumberjacks. I hope they have a great year this year. So, Michael, what province – this is for our Canadian listeners, watchers, viewers. What province is Flin Flon located, and what team and league is it associated with? What province is Flin Flon located, and what team and league is it associated? I'm going to tell you right now, there might, so, be, there might be a trick question. Well, I think – uh, I keep getting uh, the AJ and the MJ uh, a little bit twisted. So I you're think gonna need Flint help on this one. Is in the MJ, and they're in Manitoba. I don't, I don't know. Anybody that can help him out of this gym, okay? Okay, so not bad, Frank. Frank's gonna come in and strong on an answer here. But Frank, okay, this is a, I like that one. This this is a this is a trick question though. So uh, I know Frank. Uh, I do. I believe Frank is Canadian. Uh, let's see if he can figure out the trick part of it. Or anybody, anybody want to jump on and ask? Uh, oh, and here it is. Here it is. It's actually Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Oh, it's right on the border. It's it's split. So uh, so the well, you bombers. Give whoever the Facebook user credit for getting it right. That's that's correct. We'll we'll look that up in a second. I can't do everything here. I'm directing, producing, and trying to be the talent <laughs> on the show at the same time. So Flynn Flan has – oh, Denise, it says. So, Denise, really good job for Facebook uh, user. Uh, Flynn Flan, population 5185, 4982 on the Manitoba side and 205 on the Saskatchewan side. So it's split. Well, not quite split, but uh, but it is uh, – it isn't too, you know, it, there's a correction line, they call it the border line, which I don't know what the correction line means. Maybe all at one at one point it was all on the other side and uh, they corrected it, which means Saskatchewan picked up a little bit. I don't know the answer there, but I did do some homework on this. Um, the Bombers do play in the SJHL, Saskatchewan League, which is interesting since there's only 200 people in the town of 5,000 uh, on the Saskatchewan side, but they're, they play out of the SJHL. So I thought that was Interesting. I thought it was fun. Good question. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I got one out of the possible three points on that question. I got Manitoba, which is partially right, but then it's the SJ and partially in Saskatchewan. So uh, let's see what everybody three. let's see what everybody out there thinks about that. Your answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. I don't think that. That you're sounds like in. when I played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I just got to make sure I can turn that off. Okay, there we go. So you know, the I also looked up what Flynn Flan uh, stood for, and uh, it had something to do with uh, the, the town was named in the twenties, and uh, I we can get into that another time. But it, it was, you know, it's another one of those places. If you uh, if you haven't, if you, if you got a junior hockey bucket list, you get up to Flynn Flan. It takes forever to get up there, but uh, it is really. Really cool. Oh, I do not know what the name of the rink is. I've been to the rink numerous times. Tell me the name of the rink, and then I'll probably go, oh, of course, that's the name of the rink. So do you know the name of the rink? What is it? Tell us. 
I'm on the edge of my seat to remember the name of this rink. The zoo. Absolutely. The <laughs> zoo. Yo, isn't that great? Yo, know, the, the, uh, the jerseys, the colors, I actually have somewhere around this house. One of their uh, old coaches, a guy named Ray Maluda. This is going back probably the eighties, nineties. And, uh, I traded one of my Marine Corps jerseys for a Flin Flon jersey. And so I gave him that and got a Flin Flon. So somewhere in the house here, I've got a, a Flin Flon jersey. I'd like to, uh, to get it out sometime and, and hang it up in the, the studio here, but haven't had a chance. So very cool. Thanks for coming in with the answer on that. I'm only seeing a Facebook user on that. So whoever gave us the answer of uh, the zoo, you know, throw your name up there so we can give you accolades and credits. Mike, how you doing so far? I, I, I overall I'm bullets after that last one, you know, I like to get everything right. And uh, that was a tough one. Okay. Michael. Question number seven, the ownership group of this team hopes for explosive play that sparks many wins. Name the team. Explosive play that sparks many wins. Two clues there should give you the answer right away. Let's see. If you need a clue, I'll give you a clue, but I'm – Hoping that the audience can come in and help you on this. It is the question is the ownership of this team hopes for explosive play that sparks many wins. Name the team. Anybody got any suggestions out there for poor Bloom as he goes through this? Uh, very so we're not tough... looking for the name of the program. We're looking for the owners of the, so the the name of the owners. It's oh, a, I got you. It says on it's the end the there, name the team. Phantoms. Oh, very good. Very the good. The on the, uh, the uh, Phantom Fireworks. That's right. So anybody that's traveling through the East and Midwest, you'll probably see this Phantom logo on a bunch of fireworks, uh, you know, those those uh, roadside fireworks display buildings that sell, you know, right off the exit kind of thing. Uh, but they, they're huge as far as the company goes, and they own the Youngstown Phantom. So... Uh, a ghostly program that loves fireworks. So, I can't believe I got that, but <laughs> I'm more well impressed done. that I was able to figure that out. Well done. Hey, somebody jumped on and threw a comment up saying, uh, would you recommend my son get a family advisor? Uh, I would highly suggest we spend an hour and a half on this Monday. Was it Monday night we talked to advisors or was it last week? It was not – well, I wasn't included on last Monday. So the previous Monday we did – oh, no, you did – you did talk about it on your podcast this Monday. Yeah, so Monday night I would jump on to, to Junior Hockey Advisor, uh, the YouTube page, and grab the grab the uh, Monday night broadcast, and uh, it's all about the family advisor, and we spent an hour and a half going through all those details, and it should be a big, uh, big, big help for you. And remember, you can even get a bonus on this. Anybody that goes to Junior Hockey Advisor, you – to page and subscribes likes and subscribes you can dm me through the facebook page send me a dm and i will send you uh, a link or a a promo code that gives you the all about the family advisor uh webinar broadcast the, the actual webinar and uh the the online class for it uh takes an hour or two to get through but it gives you all the details on it uh, it's it's pretty nice little piece and it's free. You can have it for free. We take the charge off of that. And that's a product that we've been selling for a couple of years now on our, our uh, website. So if you want that, jump on board, like, and subscribe on our Junior Hockey Advisor uh, YouTube page, and then DM me and I'll be glad to send you a copy. All right, Michael, you ready to get back to the, the uh, quiz here? I'm ready. Michael, this team's body contact could include cement shoes. This team's body contact could include cement shoes. Their body contact. What is body so, contact? A check, a hockey check. Or what's another name for a check? Body contact. Oh, oh, you might have some help coming in here. Oh, they're coming in strong for you here. Oh, thank you, folks. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Liz oh, says the New Jersey okay. hitmen. Q 
Keith says wow. the hitman. Phil says, come on, Phil. Phil says the hitman. And Facebook user, you're a little slow this time, Facebook user, the hitman. <laughs> KS says the hitman. Everybody's got the hitman. Mike, you had good help that time. That's the phone of friend for your, you. Your, uh, your New York contingent. No. No. That, plus, that was a clever little question. It was. It threw me off because I was trying to figure out because there's normally a little play on the, the question. I got stuck on the body contact part. Yeah, it's a hit. Yes, I understand. Okay. <laughs> so there it is. There's the New Jersey Hitman. Great logo. Their bus looks cool, too. So uh, across the board, cool. All right, let's get on to the next one. Oh, Keith, you're in San Diego. Congratulations. Uh so the question comes in from Tony real quick before we get to your question here. So disregard that question for a second. Tony wants to know, uh, would you prefer users to go through YouTube when we don't catch the live broadcast or watch on Facebook, LinkedIn, etc.? whatever you prefer? To be honest with you, it doesn't matter to us except for uh, subscription numbers are low on, on YouTube. And that's a monetized area for us once we crack that thousand. And since we're a couple hundred away from that thousand, we sure could use the help just getting those numbers up. So for right now, not not always, but for right now, you know, we'd love it if you watched all of our videos tonight over and over again for the next 24 hours and had all your friends do that too on YouTube. That'd be awesome. So uh, thanks, thanks, Tony, for asking the question. Uh, all right, let's get back to the trivia question. Question nine. Michael, this league has six teams represented by two animals. Three equally three apiece. Name the two animals. You got to figure out the league, and then you got to figure out the animals. So there's one animal that three teams are named after, and then there's a second animal that three teams are named after. So if there's six teams, you could probably eliminate a few leagues. I, I yeah. highly recommend you forget about the SIJHL on this one. I don't yeah. think that league's going to help you Every here. Every team is the same name. <laughs> I think, I, I think that'd, be, that'd be kind of funny, though. Uh, it's got to be the, the USPHL premiere again just because there's so many teams. Oh, well, let's hope we got some help coming in for you. Let's hope <laughs> we got some help coming in. I will, tell, I will help you this far. It is not the USPHL. Is, is, it, a North Amer is it a uh, American Junior League team? It's in or, North America. Well, that I'm doesn't help you. We're I'm only not, talking about. I just eliminated 71 teams for you. You take away the USPHL premier. Come on, yeah. folks. You got to help him on this one. That's a good question, but he's going to need help. Everybody's on Google right now. Oh, holy smokes. Home run. I'm hoping you, you did this. Answer? KS comes in hard with a good answer, and it is the correct answer. The Bulls and the Bears in the North American Hockey League. So can you name them? Bloomer, can you name the teams? Well, North Iowa Bulls. Boom. Amarillo Bulls. Boom. And then uh, Actually, what, was the other, what was the other one? Amarillo well, became can... the Bulls of North, from uh, North Iowa. Okay. So now they're, now they're the Wranglers. Okay. Keep going. Oh, KS is doing all your work for you. Well done, KS. Dude, oh, this is one of your – I got to use the effing word here. You work for one of these effing teams, and you didn't even mention them. <laughs> I was thinking that they were the exact same name, like Bulls for three different team names. Well, that Not, would be just too easy, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, but that's how I understood the question. So, <laughs> so then there's the Austin Bruins, which uh, yeah. both Phil and – uh, and Keith, they've uh, come up with that answer. Come on, folks. There's a couple more bears out there. Do I got to go to the answer sheet? I will. Great job, though. KS coming in strong for you. The yeah, Bulls. Yeah, that was a huge help. The Bulls. The Bears. Being a Chicago guy, I threw that in there for you. Yeah, but unfortunately, my reading comprehension did not pay off on that. So Keith's still going crazy on this. Phil's so, still going. Maryland back, Black Bears, they got it. They figured it out. Uh, in the Minotauro one, uh, Minnesota, um, 
it's a half bull up top. It's a man's body with a uh, bull head on it, kind of like the uh, <laughs> the Amarillo. But tell you what, Amarillo had to get rid of their uh, their mascot. Uh, Amarillo's mascot. They had it looked like the Red Bull bull, you know, from the Red Bull company. Yep. But this mascot had this huge bull head, all red. Everything's red, but literally was stuck in first gear on everything. It, it looked like the guy said, okay, I'm going to work. Eight downers, boom, boom, boom. Okay, now I'm as slow as I can possibly go. My my resting heart rate is at four, and now I'll go out and I'll be a mascot on the ice. This guy lumbered around and waved like this, you know. It was the most depressing when you were talking about Eeyore earlier today, when you and I were talking, yes. their Amarillo Bulls, that, that Red Bull was the Eeyore of the NAHL. I'm so glad that that mascot's gone. Sorry, a little side side note. I know well, I get Andrew, carried away. That's a Jeff Colson special right there, baby. All right. You got you to gotta redeem yourself, man. To be honest with you, I think you're well below 50%. I'm powering down here. I got I to gotta have some Red Bull. Question 10. Michael, between the AJHL and the BCHL, who has the tallest player? Between the AJHL and the BCHL, who has the tallest player? I'm going to go the BC route. Oh, going BC. Now, this one's a hard one for people to cheat and Google on to get the answer. So, let's see. We'll give a, the audience a second to come in and help. Uh, but I just go really... to elite prospects, type in the league, scroll all the way down to the bottom and see who has the, Oh, what are you looking for? The, the tallest in, in, uh, in the league. So if he's like six, seven or something like that, then that's the winner. Then you got to exit out of that and you got to go into the other AJ, team and do it all over again. But the answer is it's the BCHL six, nine. Is that a goalie? No. It, 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 not only is it six, nine, uh, people are guessing the AJ, your your audience did not come in very good on this one. Got two AJs, and when it says, I say the AJ, that's coming in with uh, Junie jumped in just throwing one out. Just, I'll give it a shot, you know. And then, uh, <laughs> so then uh, KS says, my son roomed. Come on, KS, get you up there. KS says, my son roomed with a 6'5 D-man in the BCHL. Well, guess what? Somebody else roomed with a six nine guy. Just tell that to your son. <laughs> <laughs> or this kid had a growth spurt. You know the yeah. uh, KS's uh, son's roommate had a growth spurt. <laughs> so, all right, so you didn't do so well on that one either. Oh, did you what say BC? You got it. Yeah, okay, you got it. Yeah, when you're one for ten, I mean, come on. I Jeez. figured you miss them all. Again, okay. with you doing the math, I'll end up with uh, no points by the time it's over. All right, let's jump into the next question. Michael, <laughs> between the AJHL and the BCHL, <laughs> who has the shortest player? Well, knowing you, Jeff, it's the same league, so I'm going to stick with the BC league. Oh, we'll give the crowd a second to jump in and see if they can help. Go on, you're, you're thinking that I would just try to – Throw you a head fake by staying in the BCHL, huh? Of course. Well, we'll see. Nobody's jumping in to help you on this one. There, I think people are just saying, you know what? There is no help for him. Yeah, there <laughs> yeah, is no help. I'm on my own. <laughs> so on this one, it's the AJHL. And look at the size of this player. Can you imagine if he lined up with that BCHL player at six nine? That would look funny, actually. So five four. Now I wonder That's how really accurate cool. that is. Uh, <laughs> so when I say how accurate, is it a young player that's still growing, or is it a kid that's five two that says I'm five four to get his uh to get his stats? Because you know a lot of these kids pump their numbers up on how tall they are, especially when you're around that six foot to six one. You know those if you're if you're five eleven, you say you're six one. You're six foot, you say you're six one and a half, six two. So I'm wondering if this is a legit five four, or if he's uh if he's actually pumping the uh the elevator skates. Or sometimes, you know, with elite prospect, they got the kid's information when he was maybe a U15 
and they never had anything else happen to update that. So you're absolutely right. Still be five four. My weight um, on my weight on elite prospects is one ninety five. <laughs> so. And I'm sticking for it. Oh, here's a tough one for you. Don't look this up at home, folks. If you're at home, do this from your memory. Don't Google this one. What, Michael? What does the NCDC stand for? The National Collegiate Development Conference. Whoa. Whoa. Did you just say the National Development, the National Collegiate Development Conference? Yeah. That's pretty Isn't good. Is that right? You got it right. Oh, I, my God. I, I was part of that, and I couldn't tell you what the answer was. <laughs> so there we go. National Collegiate Development Conference. I either saw that at some point and it got stuck in my brain or because I just feel like I guessed it. And that's crazy. Isn't that crazy? That's just unbelievable. Just crazy. Unbelievably crazy. How about that? You can't believe it? Either can I. All right, here's one. Michael, if I'm playing in the CCHL, what part of the world am I located? And... What does the CCHL stand for? Is that a Russian team? No, it's a Canadian team. I think it's the Central Canadian Hockey League, and it's typically in Ontario. Holy smokes. We won't even wait for the crowd on that one. We're going to go right to the applause. Not bad, man. See, I thought that CCHL might throw you where you you got yourself all clogged up with the old Russian Teams, no, the no, no. I have had quite a few players over my years uh, play in that league. It's a, it's a good league, actually. It's a very good league. It's a very good league, and uh, that usually one way to look at that is that's the that's the perimeter uh, on the east side of Toronto. If you kind of build a horseshoe around the east side of Toronto, that's where your CCHL teams are located. So very good on that question. And let's see, do I have another one? I think I might have ended it there. There we go. The C C H L is the name, and that's a, I love their logo. I think that's one of the yeah, coolest logos cool. out there. Their commissioner is a good follow on uh, on uh, Twitter. If you guys are, are interested, he's got a lot of good points and and uh, has some good opinions and things like that. So I follow him uh, and uh, get some enjoyment out of it. Well, listen, that's that's it. Uh, that's all we got, folks. We can jump into some of the questions. I know we had a couple on there. Well done. For yes, you that, that you. helped Michael out, thank you so much for helping him out. He needed everybody's help there. Yeah, and, uh, and you nice guys job did. putting that together, Jeff. That was Pardon? fun. Yeah. I said, nice job putting it together. That was oh, fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, what's nice about it is even though we were having fun with it, there's still a lot of information to get a better handle of what's out there and where right. things are at. So I, uh, I really enjoyed that too. So uh, you got some people jumping in saying – that was cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it was. I appreciate you guys all. It's fun when we had participation, too. If it wasn't for the participation, it's just me and you talking like we do two hours a day. And that's, you know, wait, wait. I try to get you off the phone all day long, and, oh, yeah. uh, and that doesn't happen very well. So, all right. Well, once again, thank you. Let's jump back in. Let me see if I can scroll back and uh, and grab a couple of these questions and see if we can jump in and, and help some people out here. Um. Okay, so we got one here coming on here. Phil says, uh, my son is a first-year player in the NCDC, eight ga- games into the season. He suffered a, a high ankle fracture. Ooh, I hope he's getting better on that. He was a top six prior to the injury. The team is currently making a strong playoff run. After being out 10 weeks, he returned last week and has, told, has been told uh, he'll be a healthy uh, scratch for a while. Uh, any words of wisdom should he ask to drop uh, into the premier division to get games, uh, game time, or hang tight and, and wait for his opportunity? Thanks in advance. Mike, give that a shot. What do you think? What would you tell Phil? Wow, that is that's a tough scenario because the the last thing I I would want to know a little bit more of like how good of a relationship you have with that staff because um, the last thing I'd want him to do is to voluntarily go down to the Premier League and then them never give him a chance to come back up. And then he's kind of stuck in that 
in that program and, and whatnot. The advantage of that is obviously he'd be able to play and he'd most likely be one of the best players on that team. Yep. But the disadvantage, again, is just if they never give him a chance to come back up and he finishes out there and then now he's, you know, I don't want to say you're handcuffed in some cases because when the season ends, you can always try to, you know, make that team again in the NCDC or another team or, or whatnot. But, you know, I would – if I was the player, I'd probably want to try to earn my way back on in practice and, you know, maybe doing more film with the coaches and doing anything I can to, to try to get back into their confidence, you know, get their confidence into me that I can get back and play, then choose to like completely leave that situation with no, you know, timetable or any type of dialogue of like when I could come back type of deal. So that's where like the relationship would have to, come into play if I would have ever considered coming down or telling someone to come down, you know, go down and play there and, and whatever else I need to know that there's a definitive timetable of him coming yeah. back. Yeah. So I, I'm looking at it very similar to you, Mike. I, I'm looking at this and saying a couple of things here. Um, or I'm, I'm pulling this out of what Phil, information Phil gave us first year junior player. Um, probably <laughs> I tell this story, uh, once in a while, uh, my youngest son was a first year player in the AGHL a few years ago. Um, defenseman, uh, went to one of the better teams and started off really, really strong. Uh, there was four or five rookies on the team at the time and the rookies rotated. So he didn't put it, he never had all five in the lineup and they were told that before the season started and they were told how things were going to work before the season started. Hey, you know, when your name's up and that's time, you're, you're going to be, you know, sit for a game and we'll keep rotating through. Now, my son got a little full of himself because he jumped out and put a lot of points up right away and was one of the higher points to getters on the team in the top three, I think. And so we got just a little more full of himself and uh, we tend to let him make his, you know, decisions and just kind of guide him. We never really steer him by grabbing his nose and dragging him through the, uh, the mud like we should. Uh, so he, he went in and uh, thought he had a really str strong relationship with a coach who was also the GM and said, Coach, you know, uh, and it happened right after a showcase. He was sat and uh, the showcase had a few major uh, college teams that were looking at him and, you know, he got sat and he was embarrassed, you know, because if you're that good, why are you sitting in the stands is his logic. Uh, so the, the uh, coach said, hey, no problem. I'll make sure you're in the lineup and you get in every game. And the next week he was on the last place team and uh, the coach made it, made a promise that he kept just wasn't with his team. So you, you got to be careful here as a first year player. Uh, I think if you've got the, your son has the ability and being a first year player, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing if you've got the relationship for the two of you to have a conversation with the, the head coach, if it's that type of relationship, I don't know the ground rules that were set with this team ahead of time. Can parents and players talk to the coach? Can they go directly to the coach? What's the, you know, every team runs that differently. Some it's a very open door and it's very upfront. Others it's, it's kind of a closed door and a, in a closed process. So I would be concerned as a first year player, uh, not to rock the boat too much, but there's some ways to do it that you might, you know, his son might at the right time in practice or, you know, when they're, uh, when they're coming on and off the ice or in the locker room, maybe, uh, suggest that he dresses as a 7th D um, and just gets back on the bench and gets a shift here or there uh, because that's not a bad way to get back in after 10 weeks off. Um, I'm inclined to also fully explore if the coach is willing to allow your son to talk about it, uh, the premier option. If I'm still practicing every day with my team, but I'm able to jump in premier games, you know, maybe practice with them and also you know, play in their games, as long as I'm on the ice practicing, I've lost nothing because I'm still in my locker room with my teammates. I'm still practicing with them every day. Um, I'm just getting some extra games with the premier team. I don't think that's a bad option. Once again, I don't know your relationship with the coach. I don't know how that team is structured. And uh, so it's, it's almost better that we answer it not knowing who that team is or who the coach is because we give more of an objective plus and minus on that. So a little bit different thoughts on, the, on that. Um, yeah, but if you look at it too from a coaching standpoint, you know, if they're, you know, on a playoff push right now and they had their lineup set when he was injured, 
and now they're going to have to select a player that has really helped them kind of, you know, make this push, and they're going to have to now take that player out of the lineup for somebody who hasn't played for a while and, you know, may still be yep. a little bit slow yep. to adjust and things like that. That may be something that the coach doesn't necessarily want to have to do unless yep. that player through practice and things like that shows that they are now outperforming some of the players that he would then have to take out. And, and in that case, you know, that the decision has already been made because he's, you know, practicing and doing all the things that he should be and he's back on track. And now the coach has confidence to make that tweak. Um, but that, then again, that's just like the, you got to have to understand the scenario and where the team's at, what the coach is like, what you can have conversations about, you know, like Jeff's point, if you can do both where you're getting in games with the premier team, but you're still staying with your own team. You know, I don't know how close that even is, if it's the same building and same program for the two teams or, you know, if you have to be completely different, you know, as far as yep. like where you live and where you're at for that. Um, it's something to consider, but it might also be a, a little test that the coach is giving um, your son to see how hard he's going to work to get his spot back. You know, yeah. so there's that element too. So that's why, you know, in my world, if you can get on the ice every day with that team, your team, and work out a deal where you can get extra ice and extra games with the uh, the the lower team, the premier team. Um, I would say jump on that because, you know, from my perspective, that's showing the coach I'm at every practice busting my butt for you, but I'm also going to jump on the ice and bust my butt to improve so I can get back in the lineup with you. So handle right, this might be a positive. You might get more ice time. It might close the gap quicker for him. Um, on on his recovery of uh, his spot on that team and, and what he's doing. So uh, good luck on that. Please let us know how that works out. I'd love to hear a great success story on that. So we got one from earlier. I promised him that we'd jump on this one. And this one is uh, Linden, Michigan. Son is, on, is a uh, – son is a – what does that say? OB? 08. I, I thought – Offensive backer, you know, what the hell is an OB? Okay, he's an 08 <laughs> on a decent Tier 2 team, which is ending soon. He wants to play juniors uh, to prep for college. Uh, what is our next course, uh, our next step? Well, you know, right off the bat, Mike, this is right up your alley because you've got a much tighter uh, grasp on Tier 2 players moving to juniors. In fact, Mike might be one of the, the the best U18 coaches right now out there on getting players from uh, Tier 2 into to junior levels. And uh, tell them a little bit about what you do, Mike, and tell them what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so I coach here in Chicago. We have a, uh, a league that is considered the top AA league in the country. It's the Central States uh, Development League. So, you know, we have – I don't know, six or seven, depending on the birth year, six or seven Chicago area teams. we got a team from Denver. we got two teams from St. Louis. Some birth years, there's three teams from St. Louis. And, you know, we partnered with the, um, and like the NA, but it's really more for the NA3. And there's a lot of advantages to us playing in that league and whatnot. But really, it's it's developing kids to play beyond high school. And for us here in Chicago, none of our best athletes play for their high school. I know in Michigan, in some areas, there is still really good high school. Obviously, Minnesota is different. The different prep schools out east, that's completely different. Illinois, high school hockey is not strong. And most of the kids that play in it don't even have the ability to play juniors or really the want to. So at our club, we actually try to identify how many kids want to play juniors. And throughout the whole year, we're not only developing them for junior hockey because it is much different, especially coming from tier two, um, but then we're also connecting them with a bunch of options outside of, you know, where I physically coach or I should say scout and I'm the director of player personnel within the NA. We obviously have an NA3 program, but I can't have all of my kids going to that program. So it's my responsibility to make sure you know, my kids have options and they get to decide what's the best choice for them and whatnot. So as a coach, I'm doing a lot of that for them to kind of help them out because they have no idea. You know, they don't know any of these junior leagues. In some cases, they don't even really understand the USHL all that much because 
they just don't, they, they don't track it as well as they should, or they don't really get interested until they're older and then it's a little bit too late. So, you know, we take a lot of responsibility as a staff to try to help connect those dots. So for your question, I, if you can put it up there again, Jeff, I know it was kind of long and I only caught part of it, but I want to make sure we answer it uh, as best. So this is an 08. So that would be a Bantam major currently. So still very early when it comes to this whole process, but you're, you're trying to find out the best route or path at the exact right time. Because a lot of these conversations that I have are like, when they're U16s and they never really thought about juniors, but now they're starting to get interested and it's a little bit late in the game. And there's a little bit of panic that sets in at that point. You have some time now to start kind of figuring out what this is like. Um, I would, you know, try to look at a couple different camps. They have like different combines, whether it's the North American league or even the USHL. Um, I know he's a, a double a player, but depending on how high of your uh, level your double A player is, there's a lot of triple A kids that could very easily be double A kids and vice versa. So when, you know, we have one of the top double A programs here in Chicago and really in the country, we've been at nationals the last two years. When I have my kids out at some of these camps, they're better than the triple the A kids that are, are already out there. So you know, I don't get too focused in on the, the double A aspect of it. It's just where within the double A level is your team and him as a player. But I would start getting him introduced to some of those different showcases or camps just to kind of see as a measuring stick where he is compared to the other players that are yeah. out there. So I would add one thing to that, Mike. I would add that um, everything that's spot on, that's a great answer. That's why I gave that to Bloomer because you know, I could not answer it the same way. I don't have that experience with uh, Tier 2 AA players at 16s and 18s. However, with that said, uh, everything Mike was talking about right there was really focused on getting you into juniors at an entry-level junior. In other words, that's not gonna, it's going to get you to NA3HL, USPHL Elite, USPHL Premier, um, maybe the EHL. Okay, those are the leagues you're looking at. So your bandwidth is tier three juniors from where you're at right now at best. Statistically, you know, in the last five years in the Null, in the whole league, there's been one double-A kid. He played for uh, the Shreveport Mudbugs, and he just graduated last year. The Heidi kid, you know, uh, that played defense for him. Um, it just doesn't happen very often that you see, you know, a double-A kid jump unless there's – you know, a pandemic and a, a tier one player dropped down to tier two because he can only skate there because of the pandemic. Um, so that's one thing. And another thing you heard there, and because Mike's job there isn't to brag about his program, that's one of the better tier two programs in the nation. And our mantra across the board, when we talk about your ability to be elevated to the next level, which is usually a Monday night discussion, but we'll answer it still here, is get in the best league possible, get in the best team possible in that league. That's how you get exposed. It's always trickle down from the top. And people, oh, you know, if you hear people say they'll find you, I'm going to tell you right now, you know, you've got a director of one of the best uh, NAHL teams that just told you how it works. And I guarantee you when he walks in the doors of a rink, He's not saying, show me where the last place AA team is. I want to watch their game. Okay, it doesn't happen. We go to showcases. What do we do first? We look at the top teams, and we scour the top teams first at showcases. Then if we have time, we move down and try to get as many of the – because let's face it, we go to a showcase and there's 30 teams playing at 18, U18s. You know, the, the odds of us, you know, I'm only human – you know, Mike's only human. Now, we'll divide and conquer for both in the building, and, and we'll try to see as much as we can separately. And if we have our scouting staff with us, you know, we'll divide them up too, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to see as many teams as possible. But I'm good for three games a day, maybe four, and then i got to take a nap. i gotta, I got to get some food in me, and I'm out the door. Uh, it's not like the old days where I could sit there and watch, you know, five or six. Three, four games, and, you know, that's two-hour games. That's, that's a full day for me. I'm ready to move on. Uh, Mike's very similar in that reg regards. You only can suck in so much, but my point is 
If I get four games in a day, maybe five in a day, that's 15 games if I'm watching everybody. That means that's 30 teams I'll see in a weekend. But that's not the way it works because if I watch a really good team that I like four or five guys on, or let's say Mike sees a game where he really likes four or five guys and he wants my eyes on that game, that means I've got to go watch that game over or that team over again and maybe watch uh, you know and drop a couple teams on the bottom. You always want to be on the best possible team. Anybody that tells you just go out and play, they'll find you. I'm going to ask you right away, who's looking? Okay, who's that they? I know we're really big in this society now about pronouns, but throw that pronoun out the door. There is no they out there looking for you unless you put yourself in a spot to be looked at. The second piece of advice on that is always, when you go to showcases from here on out, always make sure you reach out to teams that are historically at that showcase. So if I go to a showcase and I always know the Lone Star Brahmas are in the building for this showcase, I want to reach out to Lone Star. Why? Because they're going to have a list of guys they want to see. Then they'll take that email list of people that reached out to them and they'll try to see as many of those players, if not all of the ones that reached out to them too. And that works across the board. It doesn't matter if it's USCH or USHL, NCDC, BCHL. Most good coaches will walk in and they'll say, oh yeah, here's those five kids that reached out to me with an email this week. They might only watch you for five minutes, but they're going to try to watch you. And so you've already elevated yourself ahead of everybody else. Now, the last thing I have to say on this, and this is, a, this is extremely important. If I'm watching a game, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm watching you. Now, let me clarify that because this is extremely important. If I walk in the door as a, as a Division One coach, a Division Three coach, a junior coach, and I'm watching a game, and you're like, oh, look, so-and-so's down there. You know, name, name the guy that you would impress you to be watching your game. It could be me. It really could. But it, 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 most likely I'd fall in that category. You know, Mike, maybe not. But yeah, I'll fall in that category. But here's, here's the thing about that. Just because I'm there, I've got a list. So I want to see five and 18 and seven. So I'm lining everything up to try to see the guys I want. Then I'm watching them on the bench. And I'm watching them and I'm trying to see if they're getting any cues from the stands. I'm watching them to see how they get along with their teammate. I'm watching them away for the puck. You might have four goals in that game, and I don't, not, I don't see any of your goals because I'm watching certain people on the ice. Now, if you reach out to me and get your name on a list, where now I go to that game and I'm like, even though I, I didn't plan on scouting you, I'm going to give you the courtesy of watching it. At least I might see one or two of those goals, maybe all of them. But that's the way it works. You can have a great game, and I walk out of there and go, I don't know much about that guy because I was focused on those guys. Now, generally, when you go in and see a raw team you've never watched before, you're watching everybody. You kind of get in the flow. But it, once I know who that roster fairly well or who their studs are, I'm watching the guys I like, not their whole roster. So keep that in mind. You've got to make sure you put yourself on that roster or that list so that you are getting at least a look or two. And if there's anything you heard tonight, hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's good points. And just to kind of wrap up some of the other comments, I would say is I have kids that will come to me that I coach and they'll say something like, hey, coach, what do I have to do to play in the USHL? And they'll, yeah, I had a kid ask me that at the end of in our exit meeting as a U16, he's playing double A hockey. And it's like, well, <clears throat> you're going to have to uh, adjust your expectations or you've got to get to triple A hockey right now. And when you get to AAA hockey, you've got to dominate it, even to be a consideration, because you're late in the game at this point to have that as an option. Yep. Even in the North American League at this point, coming from AA hockey to your point is impossible. It's just not a route that you can take. Yep. So when I talk to all of my players, it's more based on where you're at today, you're going to have to play Tier 3 hockey. And from Tier 3 hockey, you're going to have to dominate that level. And when you dominate that level, you can move on to the next level, which is the North American League in most cases yep. or the NDC. So it's having that conversation with the player. But to the question that was asked as, a, as an 08, if your son is at the point now where, you know, some, some people have to go to juniors a little bit earlier just because the midget hockey in their area is not as strong or right. the high school hockey isn't. So that's why you know, juniors becomes a little bit more of a reality. I'm not sure if that's your situation and your question, but 
if he can make a triple a team that's going to open up even more junior doors than where he's at today so and if he's not quite there yet for triple a hockey then have him try to develop his skill set on and off the ice you know off ice at at his age now is is going to be so important just like all the on ice development that that you can get and try to make a huge jump so if he's in the middle of the pack of his current team as a double a player well when he comes back to tryouts next year he's got to be one of the top players or he's got to be pushing for a triple a spot and if he doesn't make the triple a team he's got to have the best double a season he can and then continue that development and then make it to you know as a u16 player on a triple a team and if you can do that now the north american league is more of an option you don't have to necessarily always only consider yeah. your three teams but, but at the end of the day, most of these AAA players are not going to the USHL and they're not going to the North American League. So they'll still end up in Tier 3 hockey. They just may be on the, the higher end of that league and it takes them a little less to get the opportunity to move up to another league. So you really got to understand where your ability is and and it's okay where you're at. It's you know, again, if you're a little bit behind or he's a little bit behind, I should say, that's fine. But now you got to really start putting in the work in order to make that more of a reality. And that's what, what I do in my role and the other people I work with and on our staff, we do a good job of trying to be realistic with our players, but then put a plan in place of what they will need to do in order to get the result they want. And then now it's up to the player. If they don't go all in or you know, they, they don't want to go down that route, especially when it comes to the off ice or the, the extra on ice training, you know, then they're selling themselves short. Do uh, the last person that was on, can you turn the lights off on the way out the door? <laughs> you did that without taking a breath, man. Wow. I'm good. Good. I'm good. Hey, I'll give I you was this looking... one little analogy and I heard it from an NHL player that, that I uh, coached with for a couple of years. <laughs> and he said to a parent, he said, if your son was trying to learn to play the guitar and the only time they played the guitar is when they went to their lessons, how long do you think it would take them to be good at playing the guitar? If they didn't do anything at home, they didn't listen to music, they didn't become you know, a student of the game, or I should say a student of that instrument or music, how long would it take somebody to learn how to play the guitar if you're only doing it at the lessons? and and that's kind of the, the translation of if you're only showing up and following hockey and doing things to improve your development when you show up to practice. Yeah, if you're playing double A and, and you're just status quo as far as what you're doing, you're never going to break out and be a good junior player. Um, that's that's absolutely uh, not going to happen. Okay, you're just not going to move up. Um, you got to – there is there is absolutely no – believe me – I, I'll. You can put up any sport, any player. There's no such thing as a late bloomer. Not, no pun intended on your name, bloomer. There's no such thing as a late bloomer. There's a late grower, a kid that goes from five five to six two, and there's a late worker. And let me explain that. Chicago Bulls. You're in Chicago. Three guys on their world famous team that won. How many world championships did they win at that time? They six. I think. Six. You know, a couple back-to-back times. Michael Jordan got cut as a sophomore, and everybody's like, ooh, Michael Jordan got cut as a sophomore. He was a late bloomer, and he stuck with it. Bull, if Michael Jordan would have stayed at 5'9", like he did when he was a sophomore and didn't have a growth spurt that put him up to 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, he would have never been in the, in the, the uh, NBA. You, you would, there's, that's a dime a dozen. He grew with all those skills he already had into a body that did it. You know, Pippen, he was a team manager. And then he grew a foot, a foot, okay? He didn't, his skill level didn't get better. And, and if you look at the other guy there, uh, uh, Dennis, Dennis Rodman, Rodman, Dennis Rodman doesn't have any skill. So all he did was grew, okay? You can grow and be, put yourself into a spot to be an elite athlete. Happens all the time. You see it. If you saw Shara when Shara first came in the league, he, he was – what did he do? He worked his butt off. He was an average player that was almost seven foot tall. And then he got into the weight room. He got in with a better skating instructor. 
and he built himself into something that was important. There is no late bloomer unless you work, just like Mike is saying. You've got to work three times harder than every other double-A player if you want to make it from the double-A level up into you know, higher ends of, of junior hockey. Period. Done. Um, another question came in. I know we, we killed that one. Um, but another question came in on which league is better, major juniors or um, or the USHL? And oh, I had my great oh, oh. – Me and you always go a little back and forth on that one. But there's the right answer, and then there's you. So, you know, I had I'm, I, I got I had my great coffee caper a few weeks ago with I had a stack of USHL notes on this. But this is a no brainer for me, absolute no brainer. The USHL has taken over that role uh, across the board. Uh, they they have just dominated as an individual league. You'll still see more players from the CHL, all three major junior leagues combined. But if we're talking about leagues, individual leagues. The USHL is killing it. They put almost twice as many uh, uh, players that are drafted. Their output of drafted players is almost twice as high as any of the other leagues. You know, and it, it's uh, right now it's the USHL, and I think they're they're averaging. We just did this a couple of weeks ago, Mike. What was it? Yeah, three it was or like four? Six, six six something per team. And then you drop all the way down to below three for the OHL, and even lower when you get into the the Q. The Q is obviously the Right now, they've been on a, a little bit of a weak streak for the last, uh, you know, numerous years. But uh, it, it's a no-brainer. If, if you can play in the USHL, uh, you get the best of both worlds. You still get keep your college eligibility. And now that there's a name, image, and likeness deal, you go to one of these major colleges with a, an, an, an ideal, a NIL deal in hand, you can actually bring in money and be paid better. Listen to this. Better than many pros are being paid while you're still playing Division One college hockey. That NIL deal, NIL deal changed the world on this. So you know, if, from my perspective, why would anybody shut down the door unless they had to keep your option open playing the USHL? They're still pumping out. And it's not just the USHL without the National Training Development Program still has better output as far as NHL draft picks than those three individual leagues. You have to combine them together to beat the USHL. How are you going to beat that, Mr. Bloom? Come on, you say no, we go I, back and forth. Come on, you got your chance here. Platform's open. The only thing that I'll say, and I know you'll probably make some sort of sound that says that I'm giving a wrong answer, is that, number one, there's a different style of play in the USHL, and it's very much speed, skill. There's a ton of space. There's not as much structure. And uh, it, it really showcases the skill and the, the speed of the type of players that are in there, which is high end. In the OHL or even the WHL, it, um, it's a little bit tighter. You know, you have um, a consistent schedule that's more pro-like. And then you also have a lot more physicality in the league. So, you know, in some cases when you're looking at it from uh, what's the best route to become a professional hockey player, you know, I'm a little old school with how I like the game to be played and uh, the, the major junior route still plays it that way. But if I had a son that was, you know, 5'10 and skated like the wind and had a ton of skill, USHL is probably the route that, uh, and obviously the, the whole college aspect is a huge benefit. But if it's, he's a sure thing NHLer, I still might choose the major junior route. Well, I would say the only reason why that happens still is because of the WHL and OHL good old boy network. You've still got so many people in the NHL that are scouts that are in their f- late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s um, that work in the OHL, scout in the OHL, work for NHL teams, work for central scouting that truly believe that the OHL is what it used to be, where it was the epicenter of all junior hockey for the NHL. Yeah. It's clearly not the no case anymore. That. Yeah, it's clearly not the case anymore. Still a darn good league. And if I know that I'm going in the first round to uh, whoever and they want me to play, they say, look, we're taking you in the first round and we want you to play here. If, if an NHL team's already reached out to me and says that, okay, maybe that's a different story. But to tell you the truth, NHL teams aren't saying that anymore like they used to. Now they're saying, hey, if you want to go to Michigan, go. Because they know that Michigan's got a structured uh, strength and conditioning program 
that a lot of pros would never buy into. They play less games. They can lift more. They can get stronger. They get smarter, and they get more mature. And so all these things that the uh, that they used to you know, wince at about colleges, now they, they're encouraged by. So, you know, right now, uh, I think the answer is pretty simple for the majority of people. Now, there's there's always a reason why, you know, we, we laugh about it, but if you're really dumb as rocks and you're not a college student type of player, you, you go play majors because you don't have to worry about that. You can literally uh, it, it's you know, just get up, go dig your ditches for the day in the in the rink, then come home, you eat, sleep, and get up and dig your hockey ditches again the next day. You don't have any other complications in your world. That's not a big, you know, and, and I relate that to ditch digging because it gets monotonous sometimes at major juniors. Because you know they play a huge amount of games, they they they're, they're, all the emphasis these towns really are on top of players. You play you play in the USHL, you, not every town you walk into has got ten thousand people coming to a game. You know there's places you'll play where it's got a few hundred people, and it takes some pressure off players. That's not a bad thing to have it where there's not a big fan base that's chasing you down, where you're you're not worried about uh, you know sticking around and, and signing autographs for an hour after games. Uh, you know, there's a lot that comes with playing major juniors that you just don't see as much of in the USHL. So we killed it. Mike, we got to go. We've been on, you know, forever. I know you've only been on for a few minutes because you were late, but you know, right. some of us have been doing a lot of work here. So um, let's see if there's any real quick ones we can do. What is the best tier two junior hockey league <laughs> folks? <laughs> can let us go tonight. We, we do a whole uh, other podcast on that, but uh, that's a, the, it, Let's hang on, Mike. Take that one. Let's get that one done real quick, and then we got to go. Yeah. It's the North American League, hands down. It's the best tier two league in the country. It has the most commits, you know, especially within the league. You know, so if a kid is uncommitted, they play in the North American League. I think, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they have an eighty percent or better um, commitment rate for Division One. And in our last podcast, I think we talked about the. Uh, Division three in the NA is is probably one of the top producers of of Division three players in in all of top the NCAA. tier top tier Division three, correct. Big to make that that distinction. You're not going to just D three. You're going to the top ten, top fifteen teams out of the null, and that's a right. huge distinction. So the reality is, in the best way to describe it, is if you play in the North American League you're going to play NCAA college hockey unless you choose not to. You're going to either be D1 or D3. Very good. And that's not the case in every other. Uh, Remember, there's only one USA hockey-sanctioned Tier 2 league. Everybody else is self-proclaimed Tier 2. So for whatever it's worth, that's the way it is. So, folks, thanks for sticking with us. We actually kept people. We have more than one. A viewer right now and uh, I appreciate it once again if you get a chance go to Junior Hockey Advisor and jump on our YouTube page like and subscribe we sure appreciate any help you can do there uh, if you want the, uh, the, uh, the seminar the course on how to hire and you know everything about a junior uh, uh, hey, family advisor once you like and subscribe jump over and uh, DM me off our Facebook discussion group send me a DM I'll be glad to get you the discount code to make that free for you. And uh, besides that, Mike, thank you so much for jumping on. You had some awesome information tonight. Well done on the uh, trivia. I think you got uh, A minus. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I'll give you an A minus on that quiz. And we got to work that. Than I thought you'd give out, so I'll take it. <laughs> and I think we'll do that more often. I think that was a fun way to get through some information. Yeah, thanks again for putting that together. I know that takes some time and some effort to come up with it. And, uh, you know, thanks again to everyone who participated and helped me out with uh, some of those questions. I think, was it uh, KS that had, or JS that had the, the, the biggest help on the Bulls Bears uh, uh, question? The Bulls, that we had? the Bears. I thought for sure you'd get that. I, I hand fed that one to you. I read the question wrong. I'm an idiot. You know, we got two idiots talking in a microphone. Things like this happen. You got a friend there? Because uh, never mind. All right. Got to go, folks. Thanks. We'll see you next Monday night for. Junior Hockey Advisor, and we'll discuss the process and the path. And then next Wednesday night, we'll talk about the teams, the leagues, and uh, thank you for being a part of this. See you. Bye.